Thanks for being back. Uh, okay, we have some participants and yeah, let's go. Any questions or let's go right into, into the lecture. My usual theme is the power of duality. So here I put the Lagrangian. So I hope everybody remembers. I've been uh, lecturing on this over and over again. We try uh, to take pi in a bigger set than the Martigel transports from mu to nu. So this was our general situation. We have the mu which is less than the new in convex order and both on Rd. So we enlarge the set of Martingale transports from mu to new to make this here arbitrary and plug this in into the Lagrangian where Psi is the Lagrange multiplier. So what we do here, this is our target functional which measures the cost of the martingale transport of uh, moving every pi x to the gamma x. And then what we would like to have is that uh, the difference of these two measures is zero, so that pi y, which is the projection of our pi onto the second coordinate, uh, that the uh, pi y should be equal to the new and if it is not, it is uh, penalized uh, by this psi of y. As I told you for notation, we now put the minus in front and but still I keep, uh, you should remember the psi can have a sign so it may very well be that this is, uh, this penalizing uh, uh, changes the sign and becomes what's the What's the contrary of penalizing? Gratifying, I suppose, Ben. What, what, what do the English say? Um, Negatively penalizing. Re rewarding? Rewarding, yeah, rewarding. Okay, so this is our point. And now one more rewriting this Lagrangian rewriting because as I will show you everything is hidden in the wisdom of the Lagrangian which we try to min max over the pi and the psi. Okay so we take pi bar to be any element of Martingale transports from mu to the proper nu. Okay, so we are given this pi bar. We know that this is non-empty by Strassen and this can be anything. Okay, <clears throat> then I can rewrite and I make this up here. Can you read it? Uh, can you read this? Uh, ta -da Wait a moment. Uh, no, that's the wrong way around. So, okay. For use during the whole lecture, I rewrite this once again on integral. We have here one half w squared two pi x gamma x. And I do the uh, d mu x at the end. Okay, and now the, the point is that the new here, I can use the pi bar here to express the new, so therefore I can write it like minus integral psi of y, uh, integral uh, over psi of y and now here I put d <coughs> pi bar x of y 
<coughs> minus d pi x of y. Okay, and now this whole thing, this whole thing integrated with respect to uh, d mu of x. Okay, why is this the same? Uh, like this here. Okay, because the, uh, if you integrate over the d mu x, the contribution of the pi bar x gives exactly the new here and integrating over all this, uh, sorry, this one is the pi y and yeah, this, this here gives the projection of pi x d mu x on, onto the second coordinate. So this is just another way of writing uh, and involving such a pi bar in m t mu nu and this gives us this gives us a very nice clue on everything okay so this was just the introduction here and from now on we work with the Lagrangian in the above form And now comes a very, very important observation, which is the uh, merit of duality theory. When we try, <clears throat> when we try to min-max this thing, okay, and what we do is that we fix the psi, and so. <clears throat> the d of psi is what we do is the inf over the pi of the l pi psi. If we look at this thing here, well, if we try to minimize this thing here, well, first of all, we have to vary here the pi. Here comes the pi and here comes the pi. Okay, this thing here is of no interest because when we vary the pi here, uh, this is a constant. And therefore, we have to, to optimize for each x separately the pi. And for this, I write the following formula. I write phi psi of x is equal to all inf, to inf over all p in p2 rd. Now the p will be this px here, which appears here and here. I put an x because the requirement which we have is that the barycenter of the p uh, should be equal to x. And this we write in this way. And what we have is this thing here, one half to two p gamma x, and minus minus is plus, plus integral psi of y uh, <coughs> d p of y. So what I have uh, singled out here is that we try to find the best p pi x when we do the min maxing here, when we take the inf over the pi. And here, this is what I promised you. This is the power of duality. This complicated problem now decouples in easy unrelated problems, which means this I have to optimize for each x separately. So this is what very often happens in this uh, uh, convex optimization when you do duality theory, that the complicated problem, which involves everything, uh, decouples into independent problems because this thing here 
we have to uh, just solve for each x separately where the x only gives you the barycenter of the p and otherwise you have to optimize this thing. Okay, so this is good, yeah. This is what uh, is very important in economic theory, for example. When you try, like in Pareto theory, what is you have there, the primal variables, uh, the agents who optimize their utility. You have many agents, you have many goods, and they buy or sell uh, goods. How to distribute them? That's very complicated. But then in economics, what you do, you introduce Lagrange multipliers, the Lagrange multipliers in economics are called prices for the goods. So you introduce prices for the goods and then the complicated problem of optimizing welfare, etc., which involves all the agents simultaneously, how they divide the goods among them, decouples that each one solves the individual optimization problem and independently of the others, when you have prices of goods and you have a utility function, then you know what to do. Okay, and this is what in economics leads then to these welfare theorems and the Pareto theory, etc., etc. Uh, but this happens over and over again, and this is, this is really where uh, something good comes up. Okay, so this is why once, so therefore we can write this thing here. We can write this in the following way. This is uh, equal to integral of <coughs> uh, phi psi of x. And then we have minus psi <coughs> of y d uh, p bar x of y. Okay, integral. Uh, and this thing here, uh, the mu of x. So, <clears throat> what you do is, in order uh, to do the dual uh, value function, uh, that you optimize separately for each x, then you get this optimal value is uh, the phi psi of x. And if you write this in here for these two terms, which are now optimized, you still uh, left with this term here, which is a, is it a plus or a minus? Uh, let me, no, no, this is a minus. Uh, psi, da -da -dum, da -dum, uh, do, I, do I have it the right way? I believe it is, uh, yeah, this we have to, uh, it's, it's an inf here. Okay, I think I got the, uh, the, the, the thing right. Okay, now uh, there is one thing. Uh, okay, recall that psi is only relevant modulo affine functions. I write it like this, modulo affine functions. So what does this mean? If I, in the Lagrangian, if I put in, if I add to psi a, uh, uh, a, an affine function, I don't change the value. Uh, and therefore, it is important to look at the psi not as functions, but as equivalence classes where we are free to add affine functions here. Okay, what happens if we uh, do the argmin here? The argmin does not depend on whether uh, you uh, change the psi by an affine function. Let me, let me, the psi, the psi is not changed, yeah, not changed by an affine function. Uh, <coughs> uh, yes. Why is this so? Because uh, when you add here a constant, this changes the function, okay? But it does not change the argmin, the minimizer. And if you add a linear function, which is centered at x, 
uh, it does not matter because the P has uh, barycenter X. Okay, this I wanted <coughs> to uh, recall. And now, what is our strategy? Our strategy is we want to analyze this thing here and find the dual optimizer. And <coughs> our strategy is, uh, okay, given uh, for a general psi, <coughs> how does the optimizer And I call this pi psi x, x in Rd, look like. Okay, because after all, this here is an argmin, and we want to, uh, uh, to find the optimizers, which I denote by pi psi uh, with an x below here. And yeah. This we have to do. Okay, so for the, now I give you the plan for the uh, one and a half hours uh, we have today. I will give you first a motivation how the formula looks, how you find this pi psi. This will be uh, not very rigorous, I just give you the idea where it comes from, the pi psi. And once I have this, I will show you at the example which I gave you at the end, where you have geometric brown motion, how these things all look like concretely. Okay, and then the, the point will be, we know that we have a, 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 an optimizing sequence psi n and we want to analyze this psi n, what it tells you about the structure of the problem. And at the end, uh, and this I hope I will finish today so that you can put it on the Christmas tree. Uh, the, at uh, the end, I will show you how this psi n gives you a clue what the uh, invariant components of our pair mu nu of uh, uh, of uh, measures are. This is, yeah, this will be, by the way, there is nobody in our lecture room, but you're all in the sixth floor. If you, if you go to our common room, there is a, a, some green scribbling on the wall on, uh, to the right of the blackboard. This was done by Matthias, and this is the so-called green conjecture, and I hope I will give you a positive solution to this green conjecture at the end of the lecture today. Okay, so let's look at uh, how the uh, optimizer uh, looks for this problem here. Yeah, I can erase this thing. So, okay, so we, we take a psi, okay, the psi is given, the psi, remember it is, <coughs> yeah, and the psi, it's not any psi, psi, as we have seen uh, last time, I can assume that the, it's delta d squared over 2 convex, this was this crucial lemma, which really uh, is important for all the se sequel, which means that if I define G as psi plus distance over 2, <coughs> or absolute value over 2, is convex. Okay, and now I introduce some notation. I take g is equal to nabla of little g, and I take, uh, what do I call it? 
yeah, I call V <coughs> is equal uh, G to the minus one, and I call V is equal to G star, okay, and then this here is a uh, nabla of V. Okay, what am I doing here? <coughs> if I have a convex function, then the uh, derivative of the convex function, which I denote here uh, by capital G, and we try to organize the notation uh, somehow consistently, uh, <coughs> this is an optimal map. Uh, yeah, I make a picture here maybe. <coughs> This is, so I have here, I have here, in this direction goes the, the G, in this direction goes the V. If the G is the gradient of a convex function, yeah, we may suppose that this is smooth, uh, we are quite free to put regularity on, on, on Psi, okay, then this is a <clears throat> a transport on RD, which each measure here is uh, optimally transports by Brunier's theorem, and V is just uh, the, uh, the inverse here of G, and from general theory we know that the, the inverse is given by the gradient of the con convex conjugate, the star here denotes the convex conjugate. So this is the picture, okay, and now what I do, I take here, I take a, a Gaussian gamma, where I still put, uh, I write here an h of x, which is the uh, center of the Gaussian. Okay, well the h of x is still free. Remember, we have here the x is fixed. Okay, now let's have a look what the what this thing is transported to. So this is transported under v to some pi, and I claim that this is exactly what we are looking for, namely the pi psi x, <coughs> which is the optimizer or the argmin of this problem here. <clears throat> so, it is given when I take here a Gaussian and I transport it via this identification. You can uh, think of this as an identification of Rd with Rd under uh, a map which uh, defines an optimal transport because it's a, a gradient of a convex function. Okay. Now, the point is, the pi psi still depends on the x, so the x is the barycenter of the, of the pi psi, and the h of x, I don't tell you yet what the h of x is, but we have the h of x to play around such that this thing here gets the good barycenter, namely x here. Okay, and now, so let me give the lemma The lemma is, uh, how do I write it? Okay, <clears throat> so simply the lemma is pi psi x is optimal in uh, this, uh, if I call this star here. Okay, and this thing here, it shows you how uh, the dual variable is related to these transports here from a Gaussian uh, to some measures. I will only give you a sketch of proof or an idea and I will do this in January. We meet again on the 11th of January by the way and I hope we can do it in a classroom then. Uh, okay, where I will tell you precisely this story, what the age x is uh, exactly, but for the moment I want you to get some feeling that the psi always 
uh, uh, gives you these pi psi x. So the idea is the following. Okay, I take some point y here. Okay, and the y, okay, if I shift it to some y plus dy, so I make a variation of this pi psi x. Now let's have a look how this thing here changes. And the idea is, of course, when you make such a variation by twiggling the mass of the pi psi, then it should be at first order, you should have a contribution zero. And at second order, by convexity, it should have a sign. So therefore, you cannot make this pi psi better with respect to this functional here by moving the y somehow away into the direction dy. I am arguing here uh, intuitively with uh, infinitesimals, but it's not difficult to translate this then into variations where you have uh, gradients <coughs> of compactly supported functions, etc., and you let epsilon go to zero. So what's the effect? What is the effect on the first and on the second thing? So <coughs> the I write it like this, delta of 2. So how is this affected when I move the y at some point by some dy? Well, the effect, uh, which I write like this, this is number 2, this is here, this thing here, is of course nabla of psi of y and into the direction dy. Because when you, <coughs> here, in the, if you put for the pi, this is now our pi psi x, okay? If you make this variation here, then of course this changes by the derivative in the direction of dy. Okay, and what is the change of the uh, first thing? Well, here the y, is transported to some v of y, okay? <clears throat> and uh, when you make this, uh, when you change now the position of the y to the dy, then the new transport is, goes from the dy to the same point here, okay? You have to make sure that this is still the optimal transport, but this you can do when you put it into, into proper variational arguments. Okay, but it means that the distance of this thing here is changed by this dy. Now, what do we have? We have <coughs> that uh, the uh, distance, what is it? It is v of y minus y, okay, squared, and this is changed to v of y minus y plus dy, and this thing here squared, okay, <clears throat> because this is how far this is transported away from y, and this is what enters into the calculation of the Wasserstein distance. So this is a plus here and this is a minus. And you see, when you uh, try to, uh, when you expand this thing here, then uh, the dy term gives you again dy onto, <coughs> oh, here I wrote something wrong. Here I wrote this is of course num lambda g because the, uh, the G here, da -dum, da -dum. Uh, ah, no, 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 sorry, 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 it's okay, it's okay. So this is here the, this is here the Psi. Okay, <coughs> now what is the Vi uh, minus uh, Y? 
uh, well, <coughs> here I have the, this is uh, V of Y. I can write it like this, V minus, uh, let's write it like this, minus square over two. And this here, nabla. And here I have an inner product. <coughs> now, why is this uh, the same? Because the V here, uh, this comes uh, from uh, nabla V and it is, wait a moment, the V goes in this direction uh, and oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, uh, the, yeah, 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 uh, this is okay. It's the V minus the Y square over 2. Why? Because the V is the uh, 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 convex conjugate of the G and if you the difference between the G and the Psi is exactly the square over 2 in the when you uh, take convex conjugates this is mapped onto itself so the contribution of this thing here where we change from G to uh, from G to Psi is exactly given by this thing here and therefore we have that this thing is the same as this thing here and uh, we get that of first order these two things cancel exactly and this is at least an indicator why we get uh, this form of the, uh, of the optimizer here. I was aware that I cannot give you a, 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 a proper uh, uh, proof and will do so in January, but I wanted to see you, uh, to let you see how these transports come in and how the, uh, the Gaussians uh, come in here. Okay, now we come to our example. So, So the example and the arch example of a stretch Brownian motion is geometric Brownian motion. Okay and I have here some notation. So I write gamma for a random variable which is normally distributed and I take mu uh, is the if I take a Gaussian exponential and I do, I normalize to minus one half here so that uh, the barycenter of mu is equal to one. Okay, and the new is, well, we let now the, uh, the Brownian motion, which starts at, uh, at uh, time zero, with a standard Gaussian. I let it run another time. Uh, so this here is 2 to the 1 half gamma minus 1. So very of nu is again 1. So in other words I have uh, the Brownian motion at time 2. If I normalize properly I get the right barycenter and this is the geometric Brownian motion from time one to time two to make it non-trivial. Okay, now what is the optimal Psi, etc.? So an obvious guess. <coughs> I have again, remember these pictures here. So here are the Gaussians, here are these uh, uh, the geometric Brownian motion. So it was in this direction and in this direction uh, was the transport 
here I called it G and here I called it V. And of course we assume that the G uh, is equal, uh, the educated guess is of course G of Y is equal log Y and the other direction V of Z is equal e to the power z. <coughs> so this is just the transformation and this is modulo constants. Modulo constants because you remember our uh, the psi and the g they were defined modulo affine functions so if you differentiate they are uh, uh, they should be considered modulo constants. Okay, now what do I have? Uh, what do I want to tell you? The optimizer, the dual optimizer, the obvious one, the dual optimizer <coughs> is equal uh, to psi hat, is equal the, uh, the uh, uh, antiderivative or the primitive function of this thing here. So this is y log y and I need a minus one which is irrelevant. Uh, <coughs> okay then we have the minus y square over two because this is always going from the g to the psi. It is this thing here. Okay plus f i function. Okay. So this is the psi hat, okay, and this transports you things in this direction and in the other direction. Uh, <clears throat> what do we have? The, the V, of course, is again the E uh, to the power Z. <clears throat> yeah, modulo constants in this direction. So in this direction is modulo constant, in this direction is they are put <coughs> here. Okay, so these are things you can explicitly uh, calculate and it's everything is nice and the px uh, they are <coughs> simply uh, the uh, I take here in this direction it is the v of the gamma uh, h set <clears throat> and the gamma of H set are now the, uh, the, the, the standard Gaussians put on the right place. This you can easily calculate in this case all you need it has to do with the shifts here from minus one half to minus one. You can calculate all this thing. Uh, I just wanted, I don't want to do all the, the, the calculations here but I just wanted to tell you here is a good example. You have the obvious maps and the nice thing is the, the bottom line. There is one, one single function, say in this case it's the V, but all these functions contain the same message and can be transformed one in another. One function v which gives the optimizer for each x. So by this formula here it's always the same v which does not depend on the x or, or on the z and uh, <coughs> it it is one function v which in this case is just the exponential uh, which works for every x. And now the question is does this work always that there is one function which works which gives you the optimizer yeah I should write this is the pi hat which is our primal optimizer or uh, is this not always the case? And for this I want to show you a variant of the example. So 
So, let me make a picture here. So here I have zero. So this was the, the mu. This was geometric brown emotion at time one. And the nu is something like this here. And we had that the psi of y, the optimal psi of y. When you put here the optimizer was equal to y ln y plus uh, an affine function. This is why I can dispense of the minus one here. Uh, okay, so this is the psi of y and <coughs> ah, the psi of y I still need here the minus y squared over two and the g hat of y is just the y ln y plus affine function. Now, if I've lost you in the meantime, that's a very good point now to enter again. So I just have here the easiest situation. And now comes the decisive uh, trick or question. Draw the same thing on this side here, okay? So again, we have the similar picture. So, okay. So you just mirror this thing here. I don't write you up the, the formula, but you have the geometric Brownian motion, but on R minus. Okay, good. So this is R minus. Now here, of course, you have here again, when you, when you forget this side here, forget, just concentrate on this here, psi hat of minus y is equal again to this, uh, what, Let's speak about the G, is again the uh, ln y, that's a bad one, y ln y plus affine. Okay, <laughs> so this is the G hat at the point minus y now, of course. Okay, now, but this thing here is very different from this thing here, so if I put this thing, so this is the g hat of y, and this is, this is it here. Now, how do these two things fit together? Not very good, because here, of course, in this point, I have a problem. After all, our g's, they should be convex, shouldn't they? And at this point, it's very, very non-convex. So, how can this be? And how can we? The point is we have a psi n. Consider an optimizing sequence. Yeah, optimizing sequence for what? I did not tell you yet for what. Think of the following situation that the mu is one half of this situation and one half of this situation. So you put one half on this mu and on this mu, and for the new, the same things. So you, you first flip a coin, and then you have a geometric brown emotion either on R plus or on R minus. Okay, these are perfect, uh, two perfect uh, measures which are in convex order. Okay, so we can plug in our duality theory, we know that there is no duality gap, we know that there are psi n's, we know that they are uh, convex d square uh, over 2 convex, or when we add the, uh, this, uh, this term here, this term uh, square over 2, then they become convex. How can they look like? How can it possibly be? Well, first of all, they should have uh, linear growth, which is not quite the case of this. 
but this doesn't matter. Here, here we don't have, here we smooth out because we only need it uh, uh, <clears throat> um, asymptotically. But what do we do with this problem at zero? Now, first of all, here the derivative of the optimizers are infinity. Well, we can, by approximating, we can do something which, is, which has here a finite uh, derivative. But of course, the better and better we approximate, the steeper and steeper becomes this uh, derivative. And now, if I lost you, again, this is the point to enter. Here you are free to choose the affine function. Here again you are uh, free to choose the affine function. So therefore, when you concentrate on this side, and it should be something which uh, resembles this g hat, so this is the corresponding gn. I just always get rid of this nuisance with the, with the squares here. Then here, we, we should do the same function, but we are free to put an affine function. So we put an affine function, which goes very steep up here. So this is the affine function, okay? And then we add this function here, so this looks something like this here. And now you see, when you turn this up, then you can resolve this problem, that here it is not concave anymore, it uh, becomes convex, and this is how this psi n must look like. So the psi n's are, when they are here, uh, close to the natural choice here, then here they have to be moved up, or if you put here, if you want them to be close to the natural choice here, then you have to put them up here. Okay, but the psi n you get from the general theory, and it tells you from the psi n you can find both optimizers, the one which works here and the one which works here. You just have always, you have to choose the affine functions here correctly, in order to either give you this thing here or to give you that thing. So, bottom line once again, if you start from a psi n, it helps you to find the optimal things uh, on r plus and on r minus in this case. When you do the right thing with the psi n, you have to normalize it with the proper affine function to have it converging here or converging here. So this is why our psi n's, which we get from the general theory, lead us the way to find not only the optimizers or the two components, but it also shows you the components. And this is what we are really out for. We want in general, and now I go to the after this motivating example, let me take one minute to clean and then I tell you what I'm out for. So, let me, <clears throat> okay, so, original problem, okay, or the question which we tackle. We know from Bagelberg, Chouillet, uh, long time ago, Matthias, uh, this was the stone age of this theory, uh, in R1, and when I have the mu less than or equal to nu, then there are irreducible components, countably many intervals, ij. Okay, <clears throat> which do not communicate. We just had an excellent example 
uh, of uh, this situation uh, where our irreducible components in the previous example with the two geometric ground emotion were R plus and R minus. And in general, uh, you have countably many intervals. Between them, there may be points which also uh, remain in invariant, etc. So this is really straightforward that you find the irreducible components. Okay, and now in the question, and I'm approaching this famous green conjecture in our, uh, in our common room, what happens in RD? Well, first of all, it's very easy to see that in, uh, you cannot have it countably anymore. So you have to, <clears throat> well, what is it? The irreducible components, how do they look like? Okay, do they depend on the mu and mu or are they uh, uh, <coughs> universal? And there is a very nice paper which I learned to appreciate very much by Demarche and Tussi, uh, I think in 19 or maybe 20. Okay, there is a map. X goes into Ix. <clears throat> and this is in Cx and this is in K, which are the closed convex subsets of Rd. Okay, <clears throat> Ix is the relative interior of Cx, okay? <clears throat> such that uh, <clears throat> uh, each Ix is irreducible and there is a pi bar x <clears throat> uh, or I'll write it like this pi bar equals integral pi bar x d mu x like the one we had up here uh, pi bar such that the support of pi bar x is equal to c of x. And this is not quite true. You need this thing here, which is the support is clear. And, but this is the closed convex hull, which is the smallest closed convex set containing the support uh, of uh, pi bar x. So this is, if you remember uh, the, our situation with the two Brownian motions, the x, it would take the x on the positive axis, it would take here, this thing here would be uh, the closed positive half line, this would be the op uh, open positive half line, and the p bar x, for example, would be uh, our, uh, our uh, 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 <clears throat> our optimal transport, for example, which takes every x to a, a, a measure pi bar x with full support. Okay, so, and the nice thing is they proved this that these things are measurable. Well, measurable, you have to put a topology on this thing. This is the Weissmann topology. Then these things, they are in general not Borel measurable, they are analytically measurable, but definitely mu measurable, etc. And they construct, this is all an abstract uh, uh, construction. And this is therefore the universal, the Ix form the universal partition into irreducible components because first of all, each one is irreducible 
and you cannot make them smaller because the pi bar exhausts uh, the whole c of x. This is the, uh, the message and all these things are measurable. Measurable is delicate but with respect to the measures mu and nu everything is measurable. Okay, now the question and now this is really the, 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 the green conjecture. When you take now the uh, stretch brown motion, does the stretch brown motion give you this Demash 2C uh, 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 paving? That's a convex paving, as it is called. Because, yeah, I should say, yeah, the I of X, they, yeah, this, this comes, they cover all of RD. All these things uh, hold true, mu or nu, almost surely, etc. So the question is, <coughs> is pi hat, which is our stretch brown emotion, <coughs> uh, uh, an example for Demash Tusi? So I write it this way, an example, because these things, yeah, the paving is unique, the pi bar is not unique, but if we can show that our pi hat from the stretch brown emotion has this property, then of course it gives the, uh, this irreducible mapping of and And then we have uh, finished our program to transform the uh, baggerberg Chouillet result from R1 to Rd. Okay, yeah, I think I have enough time to walk you through the uh, through the theorem which I want to prove now. So our theorem is the answer is yes in full generality. So just any mu less than or equal to nu uh, in convex order on Rd. Okay. So I told you the Lagrangian will tell us everything. We have just to consult the Lagrangian. So yeah, and I saved space on the wrong side, so I just copied this thing here, dp par x of y minus dp x of y and erase this thing here. So I just copied it here. So there I have space. And now we contemplate on this thing. Okay, so one thing is we can change the Psi of y here by putting here any affine function and so for example uh, <coughs> plus nabla of psi x with y. So as I told you the Psi you should think of them modulo affine functions. And here I specify a concrete affine function, which is nice to put, yeah, and this I call psi, and I put here an x into parentheses, has little to do with this lowercase axis. Okay, then this is, this goes into from our d to our plus, and, oh, no, then uh, if I, this is always the nuisance with this thing here. This thing, when I add this, it becomes a convex function, which uh, goes to, <coughs> sorry, uh, if I normalize it like this, I have to put here the y minus x squared over 2 
<coughs> which doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so what I have done, the psi x at the point x is zero, and uh, if I normalize by the parabola here, it is a positive function. So this is nice, and this does of course not change the value here, but it's very important to, uh, to uh, stick to this thing here, and I erase this thing again. Okay, this I call psi x of y. So I have it properly normalized. And now comes my first, uh, uh, yeah. And we do the following. Uh, uh, the setting is one, uh, or a single Dimash 2C component. I will first analyze the situation for one uh, component and it's the situation that there is an I in the C. This is closed convex. This is the relative interior. The mu sits on the I. It sits on the interior. The new sits can uh, go to the boundary. And what else do we have? Uh, yeah, and we have this pi bar. This I had from uh, Demash Tusi. And I put this pi bar from Demash Tusi, I put into the Lagrangian here. Okay, now lemma one. I'm on my way to prove uh, this, uh, this theorem uh, where I put yes before. Okay, let psi n an optimizing sequence. Okay, so psi n is an optimizing sequence. We know that this exists. Okay, then we want to show that it converges to a limit which does the good thing on all of C. So you should think now of the geometric Brownian motion, but only on R plus. Not forget about the nuisance on R minus. Okay, then it follows that uh, sup over the n of the integral of psi n. And I put here an x uh, of y d p bar x uh, and of y. Now this thing here, uh, another integral d mu x, this is finite. Okay, now why am I interested in uh, the uh, in, in 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 this situation here? Well, as I told you, <clears throat> we are when you remember the beginning here, we took out in our optimization, we took out this term and this term, and we were left. We said this is constant here. Okay. So it does not have uh, much interest. Now when we have the Psi n, we have to get a hold that this does not run away. And this is uh, the, uh, the conclusion that at least when I integrate this out here on the <coughs> Psi n, this remains bounded, where it is very important to make the proper affine normalization. Okay, now, uh, yeah, I sketch you, yeah, I make a quick sketch of the proof. Okay, uh, what do we have? We have d of psi n. This is, what is it? <coughs> this was before integral <coughs> of uh, how can I do it? Okay, this is, well, I write it like this. Minus psi n x y uh, d pi par x 
of y and we had plus phi uh, psi n of x this whole thing d mu x. This was at the very beginning the second line when I introduced this thing where we optimized over the other terms and this is what remains here. It is the psi nx and it has a minus sign in front. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this thing here. Now the d of psi n, this converges in uh, towards, in fact, uh, towards the value of the problem. But this is not so important. So in any case, it is bounded. This remains bounded. So what do we have? We have this thing here. <coughs> if I can show that this thing here is bounded from above, uh, less than or equal than on some m, less than infinity, when the psi n, then this is, uh, this is, well, yeah, if it, this is bounded from above, this here must be bounded from below. So changing the sign, it must be bounded from above. Okay, so what I have to show that this thing here is bounded from above. And now you look at the phi psi n, I don't do it. It was the infimum of some measures which you take optimally. If you take instead of the optimal measures, just the, uh, just the Dirac measures, you get some finite expression, which is an upper bound and which gives you this thing here. Okay, so this, I hope that soon you will have a nicely written up version of this. It's all work in progress, very recent uh, progress. Two weeks ago, I didn't know all these things yet, uh, but uh, it's all now, I think, in proper form and you will soon get a good write-up. Okay, so this was lemma one. Now we proceed to lemma two. Still, this, uh, the optimizing sequence remains bounded on compact subsets of I. This is already, this has nothing to do with the measure anymore. And how do we get this? I give you just the idea. Here is our I, which is a relatively open convex set. Uh, and here I have a compact subset K. Okay. Now uh, you have, the first thing is we have our, for each X, we have our measure pi bar X. And pi bar X, remember that the support of pi bar x, if you take the closed convex hull, is equal to c. c is just the closure of this i here. Now you make the following, consider the following thing. These are slices, as I call slices. It's the obvious thing. When you try between the compact and the i, you go in every direction. Okay? Now each of these slices has the pi bar x of this slice in the direction y star <coughs> is strictly positive. Okay, so where this, this slice here is s in the direction of y star and y star is this direction in which I look here. Okay, why? Because this thing here, as I told you, the, the uh, convex hull of the support is the whole C, so the pi bar x must put some mass here and similarly here. And as you get it by compactness, when you go all around, 
this thing here is even <coughs> must stay away from zero by a simple compactness argument. Okay, uh, so this is bounded away from zero, which means that on all these slices you have, with respect to pi bar, you have uh, uh, you have a, a strictly positive mass, which is independently of the uh, direction uh, stays away from zero. Now think of the, this is the psi n and we always pass to the g n which is the convex function where we put the square over 2 where we add it. <coughs> okay, so when you have this function which is now convex and say at this point here x it is uh, it is normalized, then if it is big on this k, then you see it must be big by convexity on one of these slices and therefore the pi bar x integral must be big. But we have seen in lemma 1 that this thing here, when you integrate over it, it remains bounded and therefore this was a sketch of uh, the lemma 2. So, we are already quite far because now we have of an abstract uh, optimizing sequence. First of all, we have convexity. This was the crucial lemma from last time. And now we also have boundedness on compact sets. Now, how do we proceed? From this, it follows that there exists a sequence psi and k, a subsequence, k equal 1 to infinity, which converges to uh, d square over 2 convex psi check uniformly on compacts in I. This is a standard argument that when you have convex functions which remain bounded on a convex set, namely a generic compact set here in I, then you can pass to a subsequence which converges compactly. Yeah, compactly, I mean uniformly on these compact sets. Why? because you take the convex set, you just take a dense sequence. You can always uh, make that the psi n on a point y, where it remains bounded, that it converges. You can do it on a dense sequence. And I think geometrically it is clear that when you have convex functions, which converge on a dense uh, sequence, that then you can pass to a limit and you uh, keep convexity. So we have our thing. Of course this psi hat should be our good uh, psi, uh, uh, the psi check should be the psi hat which we have encountered before. And when you think again of the, uh, of the example of uh, the two convex brown emotions, then whether you start with x in R plus or you start with x in R minus, this normalization should have given you, in one case, the version where the affine functions are such that this ether converges on R plus or on R minus. Okay, now what we still have to do is that the psi hat really gives you on our uh, in our setting really gives you the dual optimizer, whatever this is, uh, so that this is the one function which gives you all the good transports as I have motivated before. Okay, so I erase all this. So what's the next step? Uh, okay, 
So the strategy is uh, what we want, show that psi check, which we have now the function. It's still a priori, it depends on the subsequence, okay? And of course, finally, we have to show that it does not depend on the subsequence, that this is equal to the psi hat, <coughs> which is the dual optimizer for stretch brown emotion. And by definition, this is a standard uh, stretch brown emotion where you have one dual optimizer where, uh, which does work. I have not told you formally what this really means, the, the dual optimizer, but this is, I will develop, and of course this is what we have in the uh, back of our mind. Okay, so the problem is we don't know the psi hat, okay? But we know something. What we know is there exists a primal optimizer, pi hat, which is integral of pi hat x d mu x. Okay, and for every pi hat x, okay, there is a function psi hat, and now I put the x underneath, not to be confused with the, uh, with the upper uh, <coughs> thing x, transporting pi hat x to a Gaussian. We know these things, okay. We know that there is an optimal transport uh, to a Gaussian, which we have seen before. And yeah, and the psi hat, when you vary here the, the uh, uh, up to affine functions, then the Gaussians remain the same, just the barycenter of the Gaussians uh, uh, changes. Okay, but anyhow, we uh, consider this modulo affine functions so therefore, that's the right thing. So for every x, we know, we know how the psi hat uh, should look like. And the point is whether the psi hat is the same for each x, modulo affine functions, okay? And now we have here the bridge. Because we know the psi hat x, we have to show that they coincide for each fixed x with our psi check our upside check we have at hand, and then of course it has to be the same uh, uh, for all x and we are finished. Okay, and for this I go to lemma 3. Okay, <clears throat> uh, let A uh, be the x in Rd, or in our case the x in i, because we are here already in an i, <coughs> such that psi uh, hat x is different from pi check modulo affine functions. Okay, and of course we want to show that the a is uh, 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 has measure zero and then we are mu measure zero and then we are finished. Okay, so <clears throat> then the A can also be written as the X such that one half <coughs> pi hat X gamma x is strictly bigger than the inf over the p of <coughs> one half uh, and here I have, wait a moment, uh, one half uh, w2 squared p gamma x and here I put minus psi check 
and here I put pi hat x minus p. So, okay. <clears throat> so the lemma is that this happens if and only if this happens. Okay, and now here uh, all of a sudden the pi hat appears. Now why? I'm back to my beloved Lagrangian up here. And I told you this formula is correct for any pi bar, and we just used it for the pi bar from the Mashtusi. But I can also put instead of pi bar, I can also put the pi hat into it, okay? Then it's also a valid form of the Lagrangian. Okay, now what do I get when I <coughs> evaluate these things here with our optimizing. You remember there was this uh, phi psi, etc. Now, <clears throat> when you do it for the, uh, uh, for the pi hat of x, and uh, what do I have here? Here the pi hat, da, da, da. do I have everything right? Uh, here is the psi, yeah. <clears throat> for, the, for the pi hat of x, I know that in this case, the, this thing here is equal to the pi hat of x, and therefore the only thing which remains is this part here, when I try to optimize over uh, the psi hat x. And here, if I do the same thing for the pi check, and so what we get here is the pi hat, minus the p and we optimize here. Okay, so this is when you play around, this is another way of writing it. And now it is, yeah, I'm coming to an end here. Uh, uh, the point is that this thing here is always bigger. We always have this thing here, okay, which is by comparing the p with the pi hat of x, uh, but when the two are different, then we have a strict inequality. Okay, so I'm afraid the, 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 the proof is not difficult, but of course you have to organize all these things and uh, you have to write it up properly. But I tell you in the three remaining minutes, where, what we are out for. So what does this mean? The pi hat is the primal optimizer. Now for each p we can we can find a call it pi check p, pi check x, which is worse here. Okay, maybe it's not the optimizer and maybe the optimizer does not exist, this is not so clear, but we can put here some pi check x for each of the axes where uh, uh, on A, uh, where, we, where we put here a, a <coughs> pi check x, which is truly worse, okay? And you can have, you can put in some uh, uh, constants such that they, uh, because you have a, a whole set A, such that on a subset it remains uniformly bounded, uh, or there is, the difference is uniform. Okay, so these are the pi hat x. Yeah, the pi hat x is therefore something where the L of pi hat, where I paste them together by changing them from pi hat to pi check on A, and otherwise keeping them equal, Psi check is strictly less than L of pi hat, psi hat, uh, L of pi hat, yeah, uh, L of pi hat, I, yeah, in fact, uh, this here is for, maybe I write it like this, strictly less than the value of our problem 
which is just when you plug in here the uh, <coughs> this thing because for the optimizer the second part of the Lagrangian does not play a role. So this thing here is truly worse. Okay, now the pi hat x, they are sitting on the C. You remember here the C? Yeah, because everything here works on the C and uh, <coughs> we have found these things. Now, if this is C, we can also, sorry, uh, exhaust this by a sequence Kj of compact subsets of this, of this C. And you can still, the pi hat x, which give you the strict inequality, which sit on C, you can somehow contract them to sit on K, where you take here one point in the middle here, and contract them, then they become pi hat x j, okay, and if you contract them, then in the limit you still should, uh, <coughs> should get the strict inequality, so therefore I can put here a pi hat uh, check j for j big enough, and such that this all sits on a compact set kj, okay? Good, now we are on a compact set kj, and now we have that the psi n, the optimizing sequence, converges to psi hat uniformly on compact sets. So therefore, for the psi n big enough, and for proper j, this is bounded away from the value. But this is in contradiction to the optimality of psi n, and we have our, achieved our goal that this psi uh, check really does the job and is equal to the psi hat. So, I am at the end of the time, but now I tell you this was done, two more minutes, uh, this was done for one single Dimash Tusi component, but now you can take this Dimash 2C, I mean it tells you on each of the components, there are uncountably many possibly, etc. Uh, the same situation happens. On each of the components I can do this reasoning and on each of the components I find the limit, I find the standard stretch Brownian motion on the component and I'm finished with the proof of the green conjecture and I have a better understanding what the stretch, uh, standard stretch brown motion does on uh, component wise. And every, every, uh, at, at every component it's a standard stretch brown motion. So thanks for listening for those who have uh, endured until the end. Are there questions? I'm sure you have, uh, you could uh, verify every detail. Okay, so if not, thank you very much for enduring, and we yeah, see. Thanks. Bye bye. And we see each other again on the 11th of January, hopefully in a seminar room. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah.